the weekly series brought to you by Reading Fringe Digital in partnership with BCA. I'm Chris Lambert, horticulturalist and lecturer here at BCA. Keep sending in your gardening questions. This week we're talking about the site and situation for planting, hot stuff with chilies, and more about pests. Firstly, Nigel from Reading has a border that he wants to plant up, but is facing the tricky situation of overhanging trees, making it shady and dry. The best gardening mantra here is to use the right plants in the right place. You may like a particular plant, but it doesn't mean it will like where you plonk it. The first thing to do before planting in this site and situation is to add plenty of organic matter to the soil, such as well-rotted manure and compost. This will help the soil to improve its water holding capacity and add some nutrients to what may be a slightly poorer soil. The types of trees nearby will affect the soil in different ways, with conifers being the worst for drying out the soils and raising the acidity of the soil due to their fallen needles. The best plants for this quite typical situation are those that have adapted to the dappled shade of woodlands. Ferns are most people's default choice here, but don't forget that some prefer moist shade, whilst others prefer drier conditions. Choose the wood ferns, Dryopteris, as an excellent addition with their shuttlecock shaped fronds. Other useful and successful plants include hellebores and hypericum and epimediums. Lower level plants could also include thinkers, primroses and even lily of the valley for some fragrance. Throw in some winter aconite and snowdrops and you'll have a stunning and successful planting display with interest for most of the year. When you give a plant the right conditions you guarantee success and cut down on your need for maintenance as they knit together to form a plant mosaic. Amanda from Newport in Shropshire has her own planting quandary with an exposed sunny balcony. On this raised site all plants will have to be placed in pots and containers and due to being exposed to wind and sun for a large proportion of the day it is water that will be the thing in short supply. If we consider the conditions here we should choose plants from a more Mediterranean climate or those from alpine regions. Plants from these locales are well adapted to these environments and are often found to have smaller tougher leaves of a more glaucous, that's greeny grey, colour to help them cope. Plants such as lavender, thyme and salvias, sage, will all do well here with their flowers as well as providing useful herbs for the kitchen. Other plants for foliage and height include the various coloured cordylines, grizzolinia and stipotenuissima or Mexican feather grass which will sway soothingly in even the gentlest of breezes. Most alpines, commonly available from the garden centres, would do well here as well with plants such as Aubretia, Arabis and Armeria, all the A's, quickly filling in your pots as well as giving a riotous floral performance. When it comes to pots to choose for this space, size does matter. The more growing medium you have, the greater its ability to hold water and allow for deeper rooting. Pots and containers can be practically anything from an old wooden packing crate to a brushed steel trough, but you will have to consider its weight. So avoid solid stone or terracotta pots if possible and make use of those plastic forms that give the impression of being made from natural materials. Nobody will know from afar. Place larger containers nearer the wall of your building for load bearing capacity and smaller ones near the front. This also helps with the visuals for those looking up but don't forget to leave space to actually sit in amongst this containerised carnage. Avoid the use of heavier soil based composts and opt for a standard multi-purpose type to fill your pots. It will help to add water retentive granules such as swell gel to keep the compost damp. And don't go nuts with this as once wet it really does expand. For some of these more permanent planting displays it is also a good idea to throw in some slow release fertiliser as the plants use up the nutrient supplies and the compost provided. We briefly mentioned lavender and Bethan from Wokingham has sent in a picture of a rather sad plant that she uncovered whilst finally carrying out some pandemic pruning. She would like to know how to save this survivor of a zombie apocalypse, her words, and give this weary patient a chance at life again. Now, most advice states never to cut lavender back too hard, but we can see here from her photo that there is some new growth much lower down the plant and as such it would be safe to cut back to this. Like someone doing the Joe Wicks workout through lockdown, this will help the plant to slowly recover its shape and vigour. 
It would be best to wait until the flowers have gone over until you prune. But if the state of this plant offends your eyes, then carefully prune now. The soil conditions also look quite poor here. So even though lavender doesn't like a rich soil, it may be an idea to put a small amount of compost around its base and gently incorporate it into the soil to aid its recovery. Beth has also asked about how to keep her chilli plants alive. So her skills lie in killing plants rather than caring for them. Here in our chilli pod at BCA, we get the students to grow and harvest a wide range of chilies, from our mild Calora, which is only 1,000 on the Scoville heat scale, to the eye-watering Trinidad Scorpion at over a million Scovilles. Chilies originate from Mexico, so are used to warm conditions. If you are lucky to have a plant, they can now be put outside in a nice sunny spot, preferably with their back to a south-facing wall, which will radiate its absorbed heat back to the plant as temperatures fall in the evening. You will need to keep potting your chilli plant into increasingly larger pots as it grows. You'll know it's time to evict it when you see the roots poking out of the drainage holes. Multipurpose compost is again fine as a growing and feeding should be done when you see the first flowers forming and fortnightly from then. A member of the Solanaceae family, chilies are related to tomatoes, aubergines, that's eggplants to our American friends, potatoes and even deadly nightshade. As such, a good tomato feed or liquid seaweed is great for boosting their growth. Unlike here, where we let our chilies grow to a larger size, most chilli plants benefit from their top growing tips being pinched out once they reach around 30 centimetres high. This makes them bush out and can even help them to grow fewer but better fruits. Don't ever let your chilies sit in a damp compost, which they hate. Instead, water once the compost has almost dried out. The leaves on your plant will tell you they need water when they go limp and flaccid. Yellowing of the leaves is quite often an indicator of too much water or a lack of nutrients. Now many people ask if they can overwinter their chilies to make it last more than one season. You can, but it depends on the conditions indoors, as these plants will struggle with the low light levels and temperatures if you're mean like me with the thermostat. Best save the seed from the fruits, and if you sow in January on a windowsill, you'll get loads of plants for the summer. Finally, following on from last week's discussion of pests, Maria from Reading has asked if the ants that she is seeing on her sunflowers are harmful to her plants. Now, ants rarely do damage to plants as they tend to feed on other insects and sugary snacks. They can be a nuisance when they make nests around the garden where they disturb the roots and even bury smaller plants. The most likely reason that you are seeing ants here is because you may have aphids appearing near the growing tips and buds. As the plant photosynthesizes, it produces sugars that it uses as fuel for all its processes of growth and development. Aphids tap into this sugar solution as it flows around the plant, and as the saying goes, what goes in must come out. The aphids proceed to secrete a sugary substance called honeydew from their rear ends, otherwise known as aphid poop, which is frankly irresistible to ants. Ants have even been known to farm aphids as they gently stroke the aphids with their antenna to help encourage the process a natural laxative, if you will. This is an example of mutualism, as in return for food, the ants help to see off other insects that would prey on the aphids. But remember, although where you get aphids, you will often get ants. Just because you see ants, it doesn't mean there are aphids. So it's best to check if aphids are present, and if they are, tackle the problem by squishing them by hand or applying a light spray of warm soapy water. If it is just ants, then probably best to leave them be as often they can help to see off other insect pests elsewhere in your garden. That's it for this week. Thanks ever so much to everyone who's written in. If you have a question for me, email it to chrislambertgardening at gmail.com. Remember to check the Potting Shed page on the Reading Fringe Festival website for all details, as well as a chance to see me on catch-up. Thanks, and I look forward to seeing you back here next time.